a young woman was found dead on the floor of her own apartment. The police began an investigation and immediately uncovered several very alarming facts. It turned out that the residents of this complex had long noticed something strange and lived in fear. During the investigation, detectives learned more and more horrifying details until they finally arrived at an unexpected truth. But it was only the beginning. Stephanie Bennett was born on August 30, 1979, in the small American town of Rocky Mount, Virginia. When she was little, her parents divorced and Stephanie stayed with her mother. However, their father lived near their home and the young woman continued to see him almost every day. Later, her father remarried and Stephanie gained a stepsister named Diana. After school, Stephanie enrolled in Roanoke College located 350 kilometers from her home. In her final year, she met a guy named Walter and they soon started dating. After college, the couple moved to different cities but they continued to be together. Stephanie moved to the city of Raleigh, North Carolina with her stepsister, Diana, and their mutual friend, Emily. The three of them rented an apartment in the Bridgeport Residential Complex, located in a quiet, peaceful area on the outskirts of the city. The young woman found a job at IBM while her boyfriend moved to Greenville, South Carolina to obtain an engineering degree. Stephanie lived in Raleigh for about a year. By that time, she and her sister and friend were planning to move to different cities. The young woman who was only 23 at the time was planning to move to Greenville to be with her boyfriend and the couple had already begun looking for a place to rent. In May, Stephanie went to Greenville where she and Walter looked at several apartments and chose a suitable option for rent. When she returned to Raleigh, her friends and sister were no longer in the apartment. Emily had moved to another city and Diana had gone away for a few days to attend a funeral. On the evening of May 20th, Stephanie came home from work and spoke to Walter on the phone. Her boyfriend was planning to send her rental agreement via fax for her to sign. They agreed that he would send it the next day when she could use her work computer. The following day, Walter tried to reach her, but Stephanie didn't answer either her work or home phone. He then called her sister Diana, who contacted Stephanie's colleagues. It turned out that Stephanie didn't show up to work that day, which was very unusual. Stephanie was always responsible and would have informed her boss if she was sick. Moreover, if she was at home sick, she would have answered the phone. Diana asked her friend to go to their apartment and check if everything was okay. There was no answer when they knocked on the door. Then Diana asked the apartment manager to open the door with a spare key. As soon as the man entered the apartment, he saw a horrifying sight. Stephanie was lying lifeless on the floor of the room with no clothes on and bruises on her neck. The manager immediately called the police. Detectives found Stephanie's documents and confirmed that the deceased was indeed her through a photo. On the laundry basket cover, which was under the window in Emily's bedroom, investigators noticed leaves and concluded that the killer may have entered the apartment through the window. They also discovered that the home phone was in the closet in Emily's room and the cable was cut. Apparently, the perpetrator was hiding there and took the phone with him so Stephanie couldn't use it. After speaking with Diana, the police determined that several items were missing from the apartment. The perpetrator took $8 from Stephanie's wallet, two tape recorders, and the laundry basket from Stephanie's room. It seemed that he had put the stolen items inside the basket. Experts found semen on the victim's body and extracted a DNA sample, but it wasn't in the FBI database. They also determined that the cause of death was strangulation. Interestingly, the perpetrator took the object he used to kill a victim with as the police were unable to find it in the apartment. Meanwhile, investigators interviewed all the residents of the complex, hoping someone might have seen the killer. During these conversations, the police learned that something strange had been happening in the residential complex for several months. People regularly noticed someone peeping at them through the windows of their apartments. They complained to the manager, but the management of the complex could not find the person. Interestingly, at least once this person was seen at Stephanie's window. In addition, several months ago an unknown man near the lake near the complex assaulted a young woman who went for a run. After this incident, Stephanie was afraid to stay alone in this apartment and wanted to move to Greenwell as soon as possible. Detectives studied the area around the complex and discovered something strange. In the bushes they found dozens of pieces of women's underwear, which as later turned out belonged to Stephanie. The police thought the killer took them out of the apartment, but then, for some reason, threw them in the bushes. However, soon this version was refuted. It turned out that a teenager living in the neighboring apartment regularly sneaked into Stephanie's room and stole her underwear, after which he threw it into the bushes. He admitted this when investigators questioned all the residents, but he denied his involvement in the murder. 
His DNA sample was taken and it did not match the sample obtained from the killer semen. For this reason, he was no longer suspected of the crime. The police believe that the most obvious candidate for the role of the killer was the same man who repeatedly peeped at the female residents of the complex through the windows. After talking to everyone who had ever noticed this person, the detectives compiled an approximate portrait. It was published in newspapers, but it did not yield any results. As part of the standard procedure, investigators checked the victim's boyfriend. He voluntarily gave his DNA, which did not match the killer sample. In addition, at the time of the murder, Walter was hundreds of kilometers away from her home and physically could not have been there. After that, the police went to all the male residents of the complex, asking them to voluntarily give their DNA. This also did not yield any results. The experts did not find a single match among the 283 samples obtained. At this point, they did not have any serious leads. Detectives organized surveillance of the residential complex, hoping to catch the man who was spying on the residents. To their surprise, they quickly succeeded. On June 3rd, the police noticed a man who approached several windows on the ground floor and peered into the apartments. Stopping at one of the windows, this person began to satisfy himself and the police immediately arrested him. This pervert turned out to be Christopher Lee Campin, who had been caught spying several times before and had been convicted of stalking a woman three years earlier. The detectives thought they had finally caught the killer, but they were disappointed. Christopher's DNA did not match the sample found on the victim's body. He was charged with spying, but they stopped considering him a suspect in the murder case. Since then, the police continued to work on the case, but they had no substantial leads. A year later, the lead detective heard about a lab in Florida that could determine a person's ethnicity based on their DNA. However, he had doubts about this technology, but he didn't want to miss such an opportunity. As a test, he sent the DNA of four of his colleagues of different ethnicities to the lab. The experts succeeded in their task 100% and the detective sent them the DNA of Stephanie's killer. The lab determined that the DNA belonged to a white person, but this information did not help the police much. The victim's father offered a reward of $100,000 for any information that would lead to the capture of the killer. Her mother wrote a letter which was published in local newspapers begging people to share with the police any information that could help identify the suspect. All of this brought some new leads, but they did not lead anywhere. In April 2004, based on the testimony of multiple witnesses, detectives decided to interview all residents of the complex again. They suspected that the man arrested for voyeurism might not have been the only one who walked around the complex buildings and peeked into other people's windows. Knowing the identity of the first man and having his photographs, the investigators wanted to talk to the residents who had seen the voyeur again. Unfortunately, none of them had ever seen his face. Most often, this man appeared at night, and he almost always wore a hood. However, some witnesses said they saw him without the hood but could only see that he had long hair. Detectives interviewed several dozen people until they finally reached a man who saw this person right in front of Stephanie's window before her murder. His testimony was already with the police, but this time he remembered something else. The witness claimed that he saw this person a few days after the incident during daylight hours. This man was walking his dog near the wooded area behind the residential complex, and the witness recognized him by his hoodie. He watched him for a while until he disappeared behind the trees with his Labrador. Apparently, the witness simply forgot about this incident or did not think it was related to the murder. So during the initial questioning, the police did not receive this information. One thing is for sure. Detectives only obtained this information two years after Stephanie's death. Now they knew they should be looking for a man with a Labrador. Judging by the fact that this person was walking his dog in the area, he must have lived nearby. And here the detectives noted one interesting fact. Behind the forested area where the witness saw the man, there was another residential complex. He could well have lived there. The police went there and asked the staff if there was a man with a Labrador among the complex residents. They immediately gave them the name of 35-year-old Drew Planton as well as added a few interesting details. All the complex employees considered him somewhat strange. He hardly talked to anyone, never looked people in the eye, and was generally very unsociable. The man was very thin with long hair and always wore bae clothes. Many people thought he was trying to attract as little attention as possible. In his case, however, it worked just the opposite. The police decided to find out more about this person and talk to an elderly resident who, according to the staff, kept an eye on everything happening in the complex. And here they were in for a very unexpected turn. 
When they told her they were investigating the murder of Stephanie Bennett, the woman replied, haven't you arrested anyone yet? Everyone knows it was that guy with the big dog. The detectives were, to say the least, shocked. It took them two years to get to this person and the residents of his complex initially suspected this man, but none of them deemed it necessary to share their suspicions with the police and settled on the other side of town. The investigators decided to talk to him and came to his apartment, but no one responded to their knock on the door. They came there several more times at different times of the day and never received an answer. Either the man was never home or he intentionally did not open the door for them. While they tried to locate Drew, the police questioned his former neighbors at his old place of residence. They managed to find several witnesses who shared troubling facts. A woman living on the floor above had seen Drew in the company of a young boy a few days after Stephanie's murder. They were walking down the street and talking about something. According to the witness, Drew asked the boy to stop contacting the police and not to tell them anything. The investigators immediately concluded that the young man in question was the same teenager who had stolen underwear from the victim's apartment. Several women had reported being genuinely afraid of Drew having spotted him during the runs or walks in secluded areas. The man would either closely observe them or even follow them. Detectives who had been unable to speak with Drew found his place of work and headed there. He was a chemist at a fertilizer production laboratory and the investigators managed to catch him at his workplace. He immediately stated that he had not heard of Stephanie Bennett's murder, which was strange considering that he lived just a kilometer away from her complex at the time. The man clearly had no desire to talk to the police and told them he was very busy at the moment. Drew told the investigators that they could come to his home at an appointed time and he would answer all their questions. The detectives met him at his apartment and the man finally opened the door to them. During the conversation, he stated that he had never walked his dog near Stephanie's complex. However, given that the police had many witnesses who had repeatedly seen him in that area, the investigators immediately understood that he was lying. The man also claimed that he did not wear glasses even though his driver's license indicated that he was required to wear them while driving and several witnesses had reported that the man who was peeping into the windows of other apartments wore glasses. As expected, Drew refused to voluntarily provide a DNA sample. The detectives then decided to conduct surveillance on him, hoping to obtain a sample in a different way. However, this proved to be a very difficult task since the man did not leave behind any items that could be sent to the laboratory. For example, during lunch breaks, he would leave work, sit in his car, and just stare at one point. The man did not eat anything, so the investigators could not obtain any objects with his DNA. Once they noticed Drew throwing an empty water bottle into a garbage bin, Detectives took it and sent it to the laboratory, but experts were unable to extract a DNA sample from it. According to one version, Drew took someone else's bottle and purposely threw it on the street, knowing that he was being watched. After that, the police decided to obtain his garbage, but here too they were unsuccessful. For several days, they never saw Drew take it out. Interestingly, the man's neighbors also could not remember ever seeing him with a trash bag. Next, investigators asked Drew's boss for help. The woman agreed to help them obtain any item from his workplace that might contain Drew's DNA. She watched him for several days, but was unable to get a hold of any item. Drew rarely ate at work, never threw anything away, and she couldn't find a single hair on his desk, which seemed strange given that the man had fairly long hair. Investigators were already convinced that Drew was intentionally covering up all traces to prevent them from obtaining his DNA. One day, the boss saw him tying his hair back with a rubber band and then bending down to pick up all the hairs that fell in the process. After that, the woman decided to invite him for a lunch break at a cafe to supposedly discuss some work matters. But even there, the man was extremely cautious. He mostly ate with his hands, put all the used napkins in his pocket, and even took the straw and cup with his drink. For dessert, they ordered banana pudding and Drew finally used a fork but then wiped it with a damp napkin for 15 minutes, ruling out any possibility of obtaining a DNA sample from the utensil. Despite this, the investigator still took the fork and sent it to the laboratory. The experts were able to find tiny traces of DNA which showed a partial match with the DNA of Stephanie's killer. However, the result was too imprecise as more biological material was needed for a full comparison. In the end, the detectives obtained a warrant to search Drew's workplace. They hoped to find some item containing his DNA. The investigators were afraid that the man might escape if he found out about the search, so they decided to conduct it in the evening. Among the suspect's belongings, they found gloves that he had to wear when working with chemicals. 
The detectives understood that his DNA might be inside, so they took them and left another pair in their place. They still feared that Drew might try to run, so they kept him under surveillance for several days until the laboratory confirmed. The gloves did, in fact, contain his DNA. On October 18, 2005, police quietly surrounded the laboratory where a man worked and waited for him to come out. Investigators feared that if they tried to arrest him inside the building, he might take one of his colleagues hostage or attack them. Their concerns were not unfounded. When the man emerged from the building, he was immediately apprehended. He was found to have a loaded pistol on him, and apparently knew that the police were just steps away from catching him and had no plans to surrender easily. During a six-hour interrogation, the man, Drew, remained silent and refused food, water, and hardly moved. Eventually, detectives had to put him in a wheelchair to move him around the area. After obtaining a search warrant for his apartment, investigators found a laundry basket stolen from Stephanie's home. Two rifles, 40 knives, a sword, and a machete. Among his belongings, detectives also found a set of lockpicks and handcuffs. They found a notebook with dozens of women's names and immediately located them to ensure they were safe. One of the women was the same resident of his complex who had complained about Jude during the investigation. She said that he had been watching her on the street and she felt uncomfortable with his gaze. Her concerns were confirmed when police found her underwear and tampons in Drew's home as well as a copy of her high school graduation tape. It turned out that Drew had broken into her apartment, taken the tape, made a copy, and returned the original. All this time, he kept these items even after moving. In his apartment, they also found a check in the name of a woman who was killed in 1999. Investigators learned that at the time, Drew lived in her city and moreover, the woman was shot with a fairly rare caliber gun. But exactly such a weapon was found in the man's collection during the search. Thus, Drew became a suspect in this case. But first he had to stand trial for the murder of Stephanie. A month after his arrest, the prosecution officially announced that they would seek the death penalty. The trial was supposed to begin the following year and Drew spent that time in solitary confinement. But the trial never happened. On January 1, 2006, a man was found dead in the same cell. Despite all precautions taken, he managed to end his life. Investigators had no doubt that Drew had killed Stephanie Bennett. But after a search of his house, the inevitable question arose. How many other victims could this person have had? At the very least, he was highly likely to have been responsible for the woman's murder in 1999. But detectives were practically certain that Drew could have been involved in other crimes. After carefully studying his biography, the police discovered several interesting facts. Drew grew up in a complete family with three brothers. Their father constantly humiliated and beat the children until the mother fled with them to another state. As a result, Drew became a very withdrawn teenager and this only intensified in the future. Despite this, he received a good education and got a decent job as a chemist. His colleagues said he was very smart, but his social skills were practically non-existent. He had no friends, he didn't talk to anyone at work, and always tried to keep as far away from the team as possible. Interestingly, Drew's own brother also had a criminal record. He peeped at women with a hidden camera and received a suspended sentence. In 2008, Drew's mother sued the state government, accusing the authorities of causing her son's death. However, the judge concluded that the prison staff had taken all prescribed precautions and could not stop the man. Stephanie Bennett's father tried to sue the management of the residential complex for ignoring residents' reports of a peeping Tom and not paying enough attention to the safety of residents on the premises. In his opinion, there was not enough lighting around the building at night and anyone could walk there unnoticed. He also learned that the window in his daughter's apartment had been broken, but the complex management did not rush to fix this problem even though it was their direct responsibility. But in the end, the man himself refused these accusations, not commenting on his decision. Thus, this complex and confusing case was ultimately solved. Police to this day wonder how many other victims could Drew have had. The available information indicates that the man was prone to serial crimes, but after his death it became practically impossible to find out the truth. Share your opinion in the comments. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. There was a booth in the park with various flyers among which was a photo of a dead dog named Albert. The owners placed this flyer on the stand to say goodbye to their pet but the detectives noticed a plastic bag underneath it. 
When they opened it, they saw a Polaroid photo of Samantha in the background with a newspaper from February 13th and a letter written on a typewriter in which the kidnapper demanded that $30,000 be deposited in her bank account. He promised to kill the young woman if these conditions were not met. The police and the FBI immediately devised a plan that could help them catch this thoughtful criminal. They told the young woman's father to top up the card in installments so that the kidnapper would have to repeatedly go to the ATMs. He did just that. First, the man deposited $5,000 and a few hours later, that money was withdrawn from one of the Anchorage ATMs. The kidnapper was caught on camera. But even here, the detectives were unsuccessful. The man was wearing a hat, a hood, glasses, and what appeared to be a false beard and mustache. It was impossible to identify him from the photograph. The police immediately arrived at the ATM, but the perpetrator had already fled. A week later, the thief withdrew another batch of money in Wilcox, Arizona, the opposite end of the United States. He traveled 6,000 miles to throw off investigators, but they continued to monitor his activities. The next cash withdrawal occurred in Lordsburg, New Mexico, just an hour away from Arizona. Following that, he made two more withdrawals in different cities in Texas. In the meantime, police carefully examined ATM photos. They soon realized that the criminal had made a huge mistake in Wilcox. He had left his car in the camera's line of sight, so the detectives now knew the model of his car. Of course, it was impossible to make out the license plates in such a picture, but now they had something to work with. Investigators feared the kidnapper might cross the border into Mexico, so all patrols were instructed to stop white Ford focuses. A few days later, on March 13th, a Texas highway patrol spotted a vehicle of that make in a hotel parking lot. There was a man sitting behind the wheel. The officer decided to wait for him to pull up and follow him. Soon the man drove out of the parking lot and along the highway. As soon as the driver exceeded the allowable speed limit of three miles, the patrolman ordered him to pull over at the curb. This was done to put the suspect's vigilance to sleep. If a dangerous criminal is behind the wheel, he may be armed and ready to fight back to the last man, so the patrolman pretended that the reason for the stop was a minor infraction. The driver of the white Ford turned out to be 34-year-old Israel Keys of Anchorage. The policeman was immediately alerted and decided to search his car, calling for backup in the process. Samantha's cell phone and her boyfriend's bank card were found in the car. They also found a gun, a false mustache, a beard, and dark glasses. Police had no doubt that he was behind Samantha's kidnapping, but they were still shocked because Keys had never come to their attention. The man had a perfectly clean criminal history. He lived with his girlfriend and 10-year-old daughter and ran his small construction business successfully. He was respected and trusted among his acquaintances. Even some members of the Anchorage Prosecutor's Office used his repair and construction services, but one question preoccupied everyone. Where was Samantha Koenig? Under questioning, Keyes was extremely calm. He joked and laughed a lot. The FBI agents kept up the dialogue in his style, and after a while, he confessed what he had done. He stated that he had been planning to rob this coffee shop for several days. He did not know in advance if he would kidnap the employee. Moreover, he had worked out two rules which he himself broke. Never look for victims near his own home and never transport them in his car. All of this made him hesitant as he stood in front of Samantha in a dark coffee shop, but he made the decision to act to the end. On the night of the kidnapping, he drove her to the shed in the backyard of his house where his daughter and girlfriend were at the time. The perpetrator turned on the radio in case his victim tried to scream and left to get the bank card. When he returned, Israel quietly entered the house, trying not to wake his family, poured himself a glass of wine, and went into the barn. There, he abused Samantha and killed her. But what about this photo they found in the park? It had the February 13th issue of the newspaper from two weeks after the kidnapping, and Samantha appeared to be alive. But in fact, she had been dead all along, and there is no manipulation in the photo. Keys fixed her eyelids so that her eyes were open and applied makeup to her face. According to a detective who attended the interrogation, Israel recounted the details of the murder with such ease as if he were listing the foods he'd eaten for breakfast. The perpetrator agreed to tell it all on the condition that the confession portion of the interrogation not be published. He did not want his daughter to hear it all. In doing so, he killed Samantha only a few dozen yards from her bedroom. The detectives already thought Key's story was nearing its end, but that was only the beginning. The morning after the murder, Israel and his family went on a sea cruise from the city of New Orleans.
Tickets for it had been purchased in advance, and the perpetrator was well aware that he was committing this murder just hours before departure. Accordingly, he had to leave the body somewhere so that no one would discover it. Keys did the simple thing and left it in the same barn. It was freezing outside, so the body quickly froze. When Keys returned home two weeks later, he took a picture with a newspaper and used a typewriter to write a ransom letter. He then separated the body into pieces and went to a small lake, 40 minutes outside acreage. Using a chainsaw, he made holes in the ice where he placed bags of the body parts and additional weights. After all that, the maniac went winter fishing. It took police divers 10 hours to retrieve those bags from the bottom. Detectives also learned that during his trips between ATMs across the states, Keyes used a rental car, the same white Ford Focus. At one point, he had a malfunction and went to one of the dealerships to have the car changed. Surprisingly, that woman played a key role in catching the culprit. The car was caught on ATM camera before the breakdown and all the police were looking for that particular model. The dealership gave him the same white focus because they had no other suitable cars at the time. Had the situation been different, he would never have been stopped. In the end, during questioning, Keyes confirmed what the investigators had already guessed. Samantha was not his first victim. The perpetrator had promised to tell them about all the crimes he had committed in exchange for two conditions. First, he wanted a guaranteed death sentence and demanded that it be carried out within a year of being pronounced. He asked that everything he said be kept secret from the press. These conditions surprised the detectives, but they saw no reason to refuse and the maniac began to tell them horror stories. Israel began committing crimes at an early age. He would break into other people's houses, steal, set fires in the woods, and torture animals. His parents were deep believers, but they practiced a very questionable and unpopular branch of Christianity. Because of his parents' constantly shifting religious preferences, they regularly moved around the country. At the age of 20, Keyes joined the army where he spent three years. A few months before that, he had molested a random young woman after spotting her in an Oregon park. When questioned, Israel said he wanted to get out of the army as soon as possible so he could start killing. After quitting, at age 23, he began his killing streak. He's made weapons caches in the woods so he could go there at any time and start looking for victims. Police found two such caches in Anchorage and New York. Inside were money, knives, gun, and body disposal supplies. Over the next few years, he regularly went out hunting in different states, but the exact number of his victims is still unknown. The FBI has only been able to pinpoint five of them. But detectives believe Keyes committed at least 11 murders and these are just the cases where many factors point to his involvement. In total, the number of murders could be as many as 30. In addition, Israel had been robbing banks, stores, and private homes so that he always had enough money to buy weapons and travel. In his hiding places, discovered after interrogations, he was found to have considerable cash reserves. The man has never come to the attention of the police, except on one occasion. In all interrogations, he denied his involvement, but detectives did not believe him. On March 3, 1996, a 12-year-old girl named Julie Harris disappeared. Israel Keyes, who was 16 at the time, lived in the same neighborhood. Police suspected him after a witness found Julie near Keyes shortly before her disappearance. It was not until a year later that the girl's remains were found in the river and her killer was never caught. During interrogations after Samantha's murder, Keyes denied his involvement, but investigators were again reluctant to take his word for it. They did not, however, have any direct evidence. In a conversation with FBI agents, Israel admitted that he had studied serial killers since he was a child. His idol was Ted Bundy and the maniac wanted to be like him. He felt no remorse for his victims and happily recounted how he managed to lead two completely different lives. On the one hand, he was a decent family man and businessman, and on the other, he was an inhuman killer. The only thing that gave any hint of feeling was that Keyes had asked the detectives to keep the details of his crimes from his daughter. He also stated that he had never killed children or anyone who had, again because of his own daughter. The FBI agents did not believe this, but they could not prove otherwise. They were all forced to admit that Israel was an extremely thoughtful maniac who had made only one mistake in his entire series of crimes. The investigators hoped that he would tell them all of his atrocities himself, but that never happened. Nine months after his arrest, Keyes took his own life in his cell. Even though FBI agents had spent hundreds of hours interrogating him up to that point, much he had withheld from them. Eleven drawings depicting skulls were found under the bed in his cell. It is possible that each one symbolized a victim. The picture of these drawings were not published until 2020. 
Thus, Israel Keyes can be considered one of the most violent and elaborate maniacs. He managed to maintain an impeccable reputation, committing dozens of different crimes, always getting away with it. If he hadn't left his car in camera view, might never have been caught. Investigators had no doubt that if he had, he would have continued to kill. Keyes himself said he saw killing as his purpose in life and planned to continue hunting people until he was caught. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you like it. An 18-year-old young woman drove her car to another city and disappeared without a trace and a week later her body was found in a river. The police had no suspects and her car could not be found for years. Only 14 years later did the young woman's relatives learn the gruesome truth. Lisa Kimmel was born July 18, 1969, in the small American town of Covington, Tennessee. Soon her parents had two more daughters and in 1972, the family moved to a town called Billings. From an early age, the girl was distinguished by her independence and determination. She helped her parents take care of their younger sisters and also worked part-time at a local restaurant. Thanks to this, she earned a new Honda CRX for herself even before she graduated from high school. The young woman also finished her license plate with the inscription, Little Miss, as she was often called by her parents and sisters and these plates would play a significant role in the whole story. After graduating from high school in 1987, Lisa decided to continue working at the restaurant despite her parents' objections. They wanted their daughter to go to college, but the young woman planned to pursue a career in her chosen direction. They eventually agreed that Lisa would work for a year and still consider going to college. The young woman worked at a large chain restaurant, Arby's, along with her mother who was the regional manager there. And soon after graduation, Lisa was offered a management position herself, but already in another city. She was to go to the suburbs of Denver, about 900 kilometers from home, and manage a restaurant there. For the 18-year-old young woman who had just graduated from high school, it was a serious challenge, but Lisa accepted without a shadow of a doubt. In addition, her mother frequently traveled to Denver for work and they saw each other almost every week. Sometimes the young woman herself drove to her family's house in Billings. The restaurant where Lisa worked was in a town called Aurora. She quickly settled into her new place, rented an apartment, and was generally excited about her new life. She made new friends and a few months later started dating a guy named Ed. He often went to Aurora but lived 800 miles away. On Friday, March 25, 1988, Lisa was getting ready with anticipation for the weekend she had big plans for. She was going to go to Billings and take her boyfriend with her to finally introduce him to her family. He lived in Cody, Wyoming, which was along her route. Lisa planned to pick him up and drive on with him from there. She left Aurora at about 4 p.m. She had about seven hours to drive to the boyfriend's house. After driving about 400 kilometers, Lisa reached Douglas, Wyoming. Apparently, she was in a big hurry. Because at 9 p.m., a police officer stopped her car for speeding. According to his radar readings, Lisa was going about 140 kilometers per hour. He gave her a $120 fine, which state law required her to give to the officer on the spot. Lisa didn't have that amount with her, so the police officer suggested she withdraw the money from the nearest ATM near the road. They got there, but the terminal did not support Lisa's bank card. According to the rules, the police officer had to detain the offender, who was unable to pay the fine. But the man agreed to let Lisa go on the condition that she send the check to the local police department. The young woman got into her car and drove on. It was about a four-hour drive from Douglas to her boyfriend's house. Woman he never waited for her that night and toward morning and fell asleep. When he woke up at about 7 a.m., Lisa was still gone. In those days, there were no cell phones, so he had no way to contact her. Instead, the guy started calling the police departments of the two states. He gave them information about Lisa and her car, wondering if anything had happened. The police accepted the information but would not file a missing persons case. The reason for this was the fact that Lisa was 18 years old and too little time had passed since she disappeared. The guy waited a few more hours and then started calling mutual friends. None of them knew where she was missing. He also called Lisa's boss and then tried to contact her parents, but they were not at home. They came back hours later and their phone was ringing off the hook. Several people tried to contact them at once to see if they had heard from their daughter. At first, the parents thought Lisa had just been delayed and was still on the road. She had traveled this route many times before, and it was hard to imagine that anything could have happened to her, but time passed and she was still gone. 
By then her parents had called Ed and called him over to their house. The first meeting that Lisa had planned for so long happened without her and under such unsettling circumstances. Two days passed. The young woman was still unreachable and the police refused to start looking for her. According to the law, it was necessary to wait 72 hours before filing a missing person report. The parents decided not to sit idly by and start searching on their own. Lisa's father hired a light aircraft pilot to fly along the road where the young woman was supposed to be. He hoped this would help locate her car, but the search was unsuccessful. The father also drove part of that route in his car, but he was unable to find any sign of Lisa. The family did not stop there. The young woman's parents contacted a private investigator they knew who had previously worked for the police. Thanks to his connections, he was able to convince the local police department to take an early missing person report. Unfortunately, they could not find any solid leads. The police immediately determined that their patrol officer had stopped Lisa the night she disappeared, but her fate remained unknown. Only one thing was clear. The young woman had disappeared with the car somewhere between Douglas and the town of Cody. The police had searched the area along that route, but there was one significant problem. We are talking about hundreds of miles of fields, woods, and mountains. It took months of work and thousands of people to cover the entire area. For this reason, the search on the ground made little or no progress. Eight days passed. On the morning of April 2nd, a man called the police. He said he was fishing in a river near Casper, Wyoming. At one point, he noticed a human body lying face down in the water. Shortly before the fisherman had heard on the radio the police were looking for a missing young woman. So he immediately thought it was her. Detectives arrived on the scene, took the body out of the water, and determined that the deceased was indeed Lisa. Medical experts have studied the body and came to a terrible discovery. They determined that the young woman died about six days after her disappearance. That is, Lisa died just two days before the discovery and detectives had to figure out where she was all this time. That said, police initially thought the death occurred about five hours after she disappeared, which later led to confusion. Had been abused while alive. And on her body, they found several stab wounds and contusions. Apparently, she had been thrown into the water from a bridge while she was unconscious. Police later confirmed this version, finding blood on the bridge. Finally, medical experts extracted biological material from the young woman's body, which turned out to be a sample of male semen and apparently belonged to the killer. It was sent to a lab, but in those years, the tools to study DNA were very scarce. The local lab simply did not have the necessary resources to extract the profile of the perpetrator. Detectives concluded that the killer was most likely a local resident who lived near the river. This was evidenced by the fact that the bridge from which the young woman had been thrown was located in a remote wilderness area. It had not been used for a long time. And in order to access it, one had to turn from the main road to a country road and then drive some distance. Based on that, the police assumed that only someone who knew the area well could have chosen this bridge for a body dump. Detectives focused on finding Lisa's car. They assumed that the killer had driven it somewhere and there might be additional clues in it, but the car seemed to have fallen under the ground and they could not find it. Investigators actively shared information about the case with the public, hoping that someone had useful information. The case was also widely televised and a lot of people did come forward. But here something strange started to happen. In all, the police received more than a hundred calls. People said they had seen a Honda CRX with little misplates as well as Lisa herself. Only these testimonies came from different states, and even Canada. A few appeals seemed more convincing to the police. Five different witnesses claimed to have seen the very car with the license plate, Little Miss, driven by a young woman who closely resembled Lisa. Except this was a few days after her disappearance on March 26th and 27th. It's hard to imagine that the young woman stayed in the Casper area for several days for whatever reason, and didn't see fit to call her relatives. Moreover, she had to go to work on Monday and she would never have missed it. One witness stated that there was a man sitting in the car with Lisa, but the police were unable to confirm this information. Based on all the inquiries, the detectives compiled seven portraits of the alleged men seen near Lisa, but none of them were of any help to the investigation. The descriptions were too different to isolate any one man. The police questioned the words of all these witnesses. They conceded that the killer might have driven Lisa's car, but there was no logical explanation that she herself could have driven around the area all weekend without calling her parents from any nearby payphone. Apparently, one of the witnesses actually saw the killer drive Lisa's car to hide it is either erroneous or outright false. 
Police later determined that there were several similar car models registered in that area and witnesses may well have seen them. During the investigation, detectives identified several suspects, but they all turned out not to have been involved in the case. Six months later, police had a new tip. Someone pinned an envelope to Lisa's grave with a note. In it, on behalf of a man, it was written that he missed Lisa and called her death his painful loss. The letter was signed by Stringfellow Hawk, a character from a popular television series at the time. At first glance, there didn't seem to be anything suspicious about the note, but all of Lisa's relatives and acquaintances denied having anything to do with the letter. The detectives therefore assumed that it might have been left by the killer. Exactly one year after Lisa's disappearance, the case was reported on a popular television program devoted to unsolved crimes. Given that it was watched by millions of viewers across the country, the police received numerous tip-off calls. It took months and extra manpower for local detectives to verify them. Lisa's parents felt that the local police department could not handle the volume of tips and leads that came in after the program aired. For this reason, they wanted the FBI to handle their daughter's murder. But Sheriff Ron Ketchum was very negative about the idea and said he had no intention of giving the case up. In spite of that, a year later, Lisa's parents still got federal investigators involved in the case with the support of higher authorities. They became involved in the investigation and wanted to work with the sheriff, but he would not cooperate or even return their calls. Thanks to the FBI's involvement, the detectives were now able to examine a DNA sample from the victim's body at a federal lab. It was compared to Lisa's boyfriend's sample and they did not match. He had not been considered a suspect before, but the investigators decided to be 100% sure. Next, they decided to check the patrolman who had stopped Lisa shortly before she disappeared. He had a recording of a conversation with the young woman that showed him saying goodbye to her. But detectives conceded that he might have found Lisa and attacked her later. The officer immediately agreed to provide his DNA sample and it did not match the killer's. The next unexpected tip came after a local radio station aired a program about Lisa's murder. The police were contacted by a witness who stated that he had seen the young woman stopped in the road by Sheriff Ron Ketchum on the day she disappeared and there were some really suspicious moments here. The sheriff himself never said he stopped Lisa that night. He also actively opposed the FBI's involvement in the case and just like that, exactly two years after Lisa's murder, a man quit the force and tried to take his own life. He was able to be recuperated and was undergoing psychological treatment at the time. Investigators came to him with questions, but Ron pleaded not guilty and refused to provide a DNA sample. This all looked suspicious and the investigators began to seriously consider him as a suspect. But a few months later, when they were ready to apply for a court order for a DNA sample, the man did provide one himself and it did not match the killer's sample. It's not entirely clear why the sheriff was acting so strangely if he had nothing to do with Lisa's murder. His colleagues pointed out that he had always been a complicated and closed person, who had been through Vietnam, so he was behaving this way even before the young woman's disappearance. At this point, the police ran out of serious leads. In 1992, they published more data on the case in the hope that they would be able to find new witnesses. According to the main version of the investigation, there could have been several perpetrators, most likely one man kidnapped and killed Lisa, but someone helped him get rid of the car. Investigators also believed that the young woman was kidnapped during a traffic stop at a gas station or somewhere else. They ruled out the option of Lisa picking up a hitchhiker because the young woman was very cautious. Shortly before these events, Lisa's car stalled on the road and another driver stopped to help her. The young woman did not get out of the car and only lowered her window slightly to talk to him because she understood the potential risk. The police never managed to get any new leads and the case went cold for another 10 years. It wasn't until July 2002 that a long-awaited breakthrough awaited them. The local police department reopened the investigation and the first thing they did was put the killer's DNA sample into the FBI database. It didn't yet exist in the late 80s and it took many years for it to start being used en masse across the country. When they did add a sample from Lisa's body there, investigators immediately got a match. The sample belonged to a 59-year-old man named Dale Wayne Eaton who was in prison at the time. He had been arrested in 1997 for armed assault on a family. A young couple and their child were driving through the Wyoming wilderness when their car stalled. Dale drove by and stopped to help. He inspected the car and said there was no way to fix it on the spot. So we offered the family a ride to the nearest service station which supposedly belonged to his brother. 
They agreed and got into his van and a few miles later, Dale said he was tired and needed to sleep. He asked the woman to drive and he got into the back of the van himself. When the car moved, he pulled out his rifle and ordered the woman to pull off onto a country road. But the woman twisted the wheel so hard that Dale lost his balance and dropped his weapon. They got out of the car and the perpetrator pulled out a knife. But at that moment, the father of the family grabbed the rifle and hit Dale with the buttstock. The family then got into his van and drove to the nearest police station. Detectives drove to the scene, located Dale nearby, and arrested him. During his trial, he was found to have a number of mental disabilities. So instead of going to jail, they sent him to a closed rehabilitation facility. The idea of the authorities was that he would spend several years there, during which time he would be held to get on with his life, learn a profession, and so on. However, he escaped from there after a few months, for which he was arrested and sent to prison for five years. The important thing here is that before he was incarcerated, a DNA sample was taken from Dale and entered into the FBI database. Finally got a match. He was 43 years old at the time of Lisa's murder and lived near that area. Upon examining Dale's background, law enforcement discovered an impressive list of offenses behind him. He committed his first serious crime at the age of 16. Dale sold a woman some watermelon and offered to help carry them home. When they entered the premises, the woman examined the watermelons and saw that they were rotten. She refused to pay for them and after a brief argument, Dale stabbed her and then fled. The guy was arrested the next day and the court sent him to compulsory treatment. He was diagnosed with a number of moderate mental disorders. After receiving treatment, he kept changing jobs because he couldn't get a foothold in any job. Sometime later, he married and the couple had three children. The marriage was not happy. The couple quarreled constantly and divorced after 15 years. In 1996, he moved to a town called Mineta just an hour away from Casper. There, his in-laws had several unfinished buildings and a bus converted to housing on the property. It was there that Dale settled in. There were no living conditions in that bus, except for a small bed. Once in a while, he would go to a neighbor's house to take a shower. As a result, there was an inveterate repeat offender before the investigation whose DNA was found on Lisa's body. But they wanted more evidence before they could charge him. Officers arrived at the precinct where he lived before his arrest. Several neighbors lived a short distance away and one of them told the detectives an interesting story. According to him, around the same time Lisa disappeared, Dale dug a huge hole on his property. He said he was going to put in a septic tank, but that never happened. Investigators dug up the lot and found what they had already guessed. Lisa's car with little misplates was there. With all this in hand, the police set about gathering all the data they needed to build a win-win case against Dale since they had more than enough time. While in prison, the man had killed his cellmate. So it would be a while before he got out. In April 2003, he was finally charged with the murder of Lisa Kimmel. The man refused to plead guilty, so the case went to trial. Because of the usual bureaucracy of the American judicial system, the trial did not begin until a year later. The prosecution summoned Dale's other cellmate to testify. According to him, the man confessed to him about Lisa's murder and told him all the details. The young woman allegedly saw him on the side of the road, stopped, and agreed to give him a ride. At one point, Dale began to molest her, but was rebuffed. Then he pulled out a gun and ordered her to his house, where he held her for several days and then killed her but no one believed this version. Lisa's parents said she would never stop at night in the middle of nowhere to take a hitchhiker. Either Dale lied to his cellmate or he made up the story himself to reduce his sentence for testifying. So he clearly had a motive to lie. According to the investigation, that's not what happened. Most likely Lisa stopped at a gas station and that's where Dale attacked her. They even named a specific gas station between Casper and Dale's house. Lisa had to drive past it on her way to Cody. Dale himself often drove there to use the public restroom and sink since he had no water on the property. Most likely he got into her car and used a gun to force her to drive to some remote location then brought her back to his station and helped her in the bus. A few days later he decided to get rid of her, stabbed her several times and dumped her in the water. Experts also compared the handwriting of the note left on Lisa's grave with Dale's. They found a high similarity but it was hard to call it evidence in court. Regardless, the DNA evidence on the body and the car on Dale's property was enough to convict him. Even the attorneys understood this and they tried to avoid the death penalty for their client rather than a complete acquittal. They pointed to the mental abnormalities that made him unable to take full responsibility for his actions, but all was in vain. 
The jury found Dale guilty and as a result, he was sentenced to death. Lisa's parents then filed a civil suit against him, which was granted by the court. Dale was seized from the land with the buildings on it and gave it all into the possession of the young woman's parents. Those, along with the fire department, burned all these structures to the ground. On Lisa's birthday, since the conviction, Dale's attorneys have filed numerous appeals to overturn the death penalty, which have always been rejected. But in 2010, the court did accept the appeal and set a new hearing. The appeal was accepted on the grounds that in imposing the sentence, the court failed to consider the offender's severe childhood, mental disabilities, and developmental delays. In addition, lawyers latched onto Dale's cellmate's testimony. The jury was not warned that the man had been promised a reduced sentence for this, so his testimony may well have been made up. Despite all this, there is no question of a complete reversal of the sentence. Dale is still in prison and is currently 78 years old, so the death penalty is unlikely to take place. There is one more point worth mentioning in this whole story. There have been several murders and strange disappearances of young women in the area where Dale lived, which have not yet been solved. The police have no evidence on hand, but they admit that Dale could have been the killer. His entire biography indicates that he is clearly prone to serial crimes, so Lisa Kimmel might not have been his only victim. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. It took 25 years to unravel this eerie story. An American University student walked out of a party and disappeared without a trace. From the early days, the police had a suspect but could not prove his guilt. It wasn't until decades later that the author of this podcast unearthed the gruesome details of the case, brought it to the attention of millions of people, and forced the police to reopen the investigation. Kristen Smart was born February 20, 1977 in Augsburg, Germany, but moved to the United States with her parents, brother, and sister at an early age. The family settled in Stockton, California. Her parents worked as teachers for the children of U.S. military personnel. After graduating from high school in 1996, Kristen entered California Polytechnic University. In her spare time, she worked as a lifeguard at the recreation center on campus. On May 25, 1996, there was a big birthday party for one of the students at the fraternity house. Kristen had planned to go, but her friends declined the idea, so she went to the fraternity house alone. That party was held in typical American student style. A large group drank alcohol, listened to music, and had a good time. That night, Kristen drank too much alcohol, fell bad, and around 2 a.m. went to her dorm, but she could hardly walk by herself. When two other students, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis, spotted her on the street and decided to walk her home, they had both been present at the party. After a while, they were joined by another student who had also attended the party, Paul Flores. He offered to walk Kristen to her dorm since he himself lived the closest who had to go in the other direction, said goodbye to them and left. No one had seen Kristen alive since then. At first, her disappearance was not given much thought. Christine's roommate, Margarita Campos, was the first to become concerned. She was sure her friend would return home after the party, but she never did. Adding to the anxiety was the fact that all of Christine's belongings, including her passport, wallet, and bank card, remained in her room. That meant she couldn't just pick up and go somewhere. Marguerite did not contact campus police until two days after the young woman disappeared. Apparently, she had hoped to the last minute that Kristen was okay and would return home. But campus police didn't take her roommate's statement seriously. It was the weekend before and it was also the U.S. National Day of Remembrance, which commemorates fallen American servicemen. The local police simply assumed that Kristen had gone home. And they were not confused by the fact that she had left all of her important belongings and documents in the dormitory. On a separate note, it was a seven-hour drive from the university campus to Christine's hometown. Too long a distance to suddenly make such a journey without money and documents, especially in the middle of the night. A few days later, the local police decided to go to work, after all, and called the young woman's parents. Had not come home in a long time and had not called her in recent days. That call made the mother worried and the parents went to the police. But even there, the police were not eager to open an investigation. They said that not much time had passed since Christine's disappearance and she might well have been out with friends and it wasn't until the fourth day after she went missing that the search began. But the search yielded no results. The first thing the police interviewed was Paul Flores who had volunteered to walk Kristen to her dormitory door and was supposed to be the last person to see her. 
He told detectives that he and Sri Kristen walked to her dormitory, then said goodbye, and she went to her house alone. He then allegedly went straight to bed, but the story quickly became inconsistent. Paul's dorm mates saw him go to the shower around 5 a.m. while he and Kristen parted ways after 2 a.m. In addition, the young man had a black eye and scratches on his knees. When asked by several people, he told three different stories about where he got all these injuries. Paul Flores seemed highly suspicious, but there was no direct evidence against him. A month had passed since Christine's disappearance and police had expanded the search for the young woman to her hometown. Catching the similarity of the story to the plot of the popular TV series Twin Peaks, the news even mentioned certain psychics who had already solved the case. According to their version, the young woman was killed by two men on campus and then driven to the cliff and thrown into the water. Of course, these allegations yield nothing to the police. A year after Christine's disappearance, her parents sued Flores, accusing him of complicity in the young woman's disappearance. In 1997, Paul testified under oath, but of all the questions he answered, only one when asked to give his name. On all other occasions, he invoked the Fifth Amendment, which allows a defendant not to testify against himself. Paul's parents then sued Christine's family for moral damages, but both of these lawsuits went nowhere. The police had no evidence to prosecute Paul. On May 25, 2002, the sixth anniversary of Christine's disappearance, authorities officially declared her dead. In all that time, they also failed to come any closer to solving the case. This went on until 2018, when a California resident, Chris Lambert, decided to start his own podcast series on various crimes. He was eight years old at the time of Christine's disappearance, and he remembered the creepy story well from the news. 22 years later, he decided to do his own investigation and was struck by how neglectful the police had been all along. The first thing Chris did was to talk to all the witnesses to those events. He learned from university students that Paul Flores had a bad reputation. The young man had repeatedly molested female students, but it never came to official complaints. Chris further analyzed the actions of the police and came to the conclusion that they had made a number of critical errors. The detectives did not arrive at the home of Paul's father, Ruben Flores, until two months after the young woman had disappeared. Given that Paul was living with his father, the police should have investigated the residence immediately, but when the police did arrive to search it, they were extremely sloppy. The detectives did not bring a forensic specialist or a police dog trained on the smell of decomposition. Because of this, the search was essentially useless. The detectives also failed to examine the two cars of the Flores family, one of which Paul may have used to drive Kristen from the campus to her father's house. Several months after the police visit, one of the cars was sold and the other was allegedly stolen. The police never showed up at Paul's mother's house and that was where one of the main clues was hiding. Chris Lambert discovered that four months after Kristen Smart disappeared, a woman named Mary Lassiter had rented Paul's mother's house. In one of the rooms, she discovered a necklace linked very similar to the one Kristen was wearing. This necklace was also in the pictures posted all over the city. She immediately took the evidence to the police, but they refused to accept it as evidence and then lost it altogether. Chris found out that the backyard of Paul's mother's house had always been concreted, but shortly after the young woman disappeared, a small piece of concrete was cut out. A flower bed had been planted in that spot. Mary Lassiter told Lambert a very eerie story. Every day since moving in, Mary had heard sounds coming from that very flower bed. Every day at the same time at 4.20 in the morning and at 4.20 in the afternoon. She would hear the sound very much like a wristwatch alarm. Soon the sound stopped. Most likely the watch's battery died. With this story, Chris went to Christine's mother. Miss Smart told him that her daughter did set the alarm for 420 in the morning since she had to be at work at the recreation center at 5. Lambert's podcast aired in 2019. Millions of listeners came away outraged at what they had heard. They were struck by the negligence and inaction of the police. The evidence Chris found further shocked listeners. Despite much circumstantial evidence, Paul Flores is still at large. Public pressure led the police department to reopen the investigation into Kristen Smart's disappearance. The first thing investigators did was search the Flores family's homes and vehicles were seized. Forensic investigators finally dug up that ill-fated flower bed, but no body was found there. Despite the fact that there was no body, the experts managed to establish that there were traces of decomposition of the human body in the ground. On April 13, 2021, Paul Flores and his father were arrested. Paul was charged with Christine's murder and his father was charged as an accomplice. 
According to the investigation, Paul began molesting the young woman after Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson left, but was rebuffed. This could explain the injuries on Flora's body. After the fight, Paul could have killed Kristen and then taken her body to his house. Seeing what his son had done, Flora's father decided to help him hide the corpse. Together, they took the young woman to her mother's house and buried her in the backyard, which was later replaced with a flower bed. Sometime later, apparently afraid of police harassment, the suspects dug up the grave and took the remains to an unknown destination. Paul Flores was found guilty of first-degree murder by a Monterey County jury and faces 25 years to life in prison. His father, Ruben Flores, was charged as an accessory to the crime. He faces up to three years in prison. Christine's parents issued a proclamation thanking Chris Lambert and all concerned people for their family's grief that even after many years of their daughter's disappearance, this case is finally solved. One thing they wonder is, didn't Flora's mother have any idea her son's crime had been committed? The flowerbed that was unexpectedly planted in the backyard didn't raise any suspicions in her mind? Or maybe she had known all along what had happened that night, but out of love for her son, she had chosen to keep quiet. Of course, some questions would remain unanswered, but that didn't matter now. Perhaps one day the young woman's remains will be found and Kristen Smart will find peace. Share your opinion on the case in the comments. Also, if you liked the video, you can support it with a like. A 17-year-old young woman and her friend went on a trip to Australia and at one point disappeared without a trace. Despite an extensive search and many witnesses, her fate remained unknown for 18 years. When this terrible mystery was finally solved, one shocking fact surfaced. The police had everything they needed to close the case in a matter of days, but their negligence stretched it into nearly two decades. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley Dodd. Haley Dodd was born on November 30, 1981 in England. When the girl was young, her parents, along with other children, moved to Australia, settling in the small town at Mandra. The young woman was an excellent student, played sports, and planned to go to study to be a veterinarian or a school teacher. But before finally deciding on a choice of future profession, she wanted to travel around Australia. Graduating high school in 1999, at the age of 17, she set off on a trip to Western Australia with her best friend, Lisa. Their plan wasn't just to drive through local towns and attractions, but to spend a few months away from home. The young women were going to look for temporary jobs along the way to cover their living, food, and travel expenses. They planned a hitchhike between didn't sound like such a dangerous idea. At the time, there had been a number of murders of young women hitchhiking in the country, but compared to the overall number of people hitchhiking safely, these crimes did not cause any mass fear. However, Haley feared that her parents would not allow her to travel that way even in the company of a friend. For this reason, she assured them that she planned to travel by bus. At the end of July, she and Lisa traveled to a town called Dungera. There they were going to work as day laborers on a local farm. They were staying at a camping site where they could get a place to sleep for a small fee. Such places are in high demand in Australia, mainly because of their cheapness. A few days before going to work, Haley decided to use the remaining free time and go to a farm to family friends, which was 200 kilometers away. She decided to hitchhike to it and Lisa didn't want to let her go alone. But Haley insisted she had nothing to worry about and would be back in a few days. To say goodbye, Lisa gave her folding knife for self-defense and some change so Haley could call her from the phone booth. After saying goodbye, she hit the road at about 8 a.m. Family friends at the farm awaited her arrival, but Haley never showed up. Worried, they called her mother and informed her. The woman feared something might have happened to her daughter, so she immediately called the police. The first thing she did was to dial an emergency number and describe the situation. After listening to her story, the operator thought that nothing urgent had happened, so she advised her to go to the local police department and file a missing person report. So she did. The detectives began their search for Haley, beginning to reconstruct the chronology of events. The first thing they did was arrive at the campsite where Lisa was staying. She was mortified at the news that her friend had never made it to the farm, but the young woman was able to give the police a comprehensive introduction. She accurately described all the clothes Haley was wearing that day and even drew a sketch of the earrings she was wearing for the police. Haley had bought these earrings a few days before the incident. She and Lisa had gone to the store to treat themselves to some inexpensive items and the young woman was attracted to this jewelry. At that time, she couldn't have imagined that those earrings would be the key to solving this terrible mystery of her disappearance. 
Detectives disseminated information about the missing young woman along with her description. Haley looked much younger. She was 152 centimeters tall and weighed just over 40 pounds. The police were able to locate the first witness fairly quickly. It turned out to be the truck driver who had given her a ride that day. According to the man's story, she had knocked on his cab window at a gas station and asked for a ride to Mora, a town near where there was a farm. The trucker was on his way to another town, but he agreed to give her a ride most of the way. The man dropped her off at a turnoff about 50 kilometers from Mora, near the town of Bajandra, where she was to turn off the main road and onto a country road. According to the trucker, Haley was in high spirits, chatting with him the whole way and talking about her journey. After she said she was almost out of money, he gave her $15 so the young woman could buy something to eat. The man also left her his number in case she hitchhiked back. He made trips down that road almost every day and could have let her down again. Later, detectives received several more calls from people who had seen Haley in that area. Based on their statements, police concluded that the young woman had been on foot along the northwest road towards Mura. Apparently, she could not find any driver at the gas station to give her a ride. For this reason, she decided to walk along the road and try to hitch a ride. Based on the testimony of the next witness, he gave Haley a ride to the turnoff on Gunder Do Road, after which she headed further in her direction on foot. The next witness was a woman driving along the road. She spotted Haley just as the young woman was getting out of her car and moving on foot towards Mora. In all, the police were contacted by more than 10 witnesses. After putting their statements together, detectives concluded that the young woman was last seen at about 12 noon on the Northwest Road, about 50 kilometers from Mora. There was another witness, though. He had not seen Haley, but still shared a disturbing observation with police. The man pulled over on the side of the Northwest Road because his engine was overheating. At one point, he heard a dog barking, followed by a piercing female scream. He couldn't see the source of the sound as it might have been far enough away. The road passed through an empty flat area where there was virtually no extraneous noise. With all this information at hand, the police's prognosis was disappointing from the start. Lead detective Eddie Rowe decided that they should look for the body and not consider the possibility that Haley might be alive. The management forbade him to investigate in such a manner, leaving it to the status of the search for the missing person. It's worth clarifying here that a murder investigation would have given the police more options than a missing person investigation, but the police had no leads that could help them get on the young woman's trail. So they quickly set about looking for potential kidnappers. In a short time, they were able to identify who lived in the area, but eventually the police focused on three men. One worked as a teacher at a local school, another was a part-time gardener there, and the third lived not far from where Haley disappeared. When questioned, each of them pleaded not guilty and provided alibis. The police could not conclude with certainty of their innocence, but they could not find any evidence to the contrary. But soon the situation changed dramatically. The investigators were approached by a neighbor of one of the suspects, a 43-year-old school gardener named Francis Wark. He told them that the day Haley disappeared, Francis borrowed his car to go shopping in Mora. When the man returned home around 1 p.m., a neighbor noticed damage inside the car. The turn signal knob was broken, and the dashboard also showed signs of impact. The neighbor didn't even have time to ask what happened to the car. Francis came home, done with the shopping bags in the kitchen, got on his motorcycle, and drove off. This story seemed strange to the police, and they decided to re-interview Francis. The man said that at the time of Haley's disappearance, he was many kilometers away from the alleged place of her abduction. According to his story, after returning home, he immediately went to a party in the city of Perth on his motorcycle. But he was not supposed to get there that day. On the way there, he exceeded the speed limit and had a serious accident that took him to the hospital. The information available was enough for the detectives to ask the perfectly logical question, where was he going in such a hurry? His own testimony seemed very strange and investigators decided to apply for a search warrant of his home. The officer searched his residence, but they were unable to find any potential evidence. They also searched the car and removed the seat covers so that experts could examine them in the lab. Unfortunately, none of this yielded any results and Francis was left alone. Almost immediately after that, he moved to the other side of the country, to Queensland, and the detectives were left empty-handed and the case went into a long drawer. They tried to find new witnesses and evidence to move the investigation forward, but to no avail. This went on for eight whole years until Francis came back on the police radar in 2007. At the time, he was living in a remote outback in a small settlement. 
One morning an elderly couple who lived next door to him were sitting on the porch of their house, was running in their direction and her head was covered with blood. She asked for help and the residents of the house called the police. The victim said that she had tried to catch a ride the night before. A man stopped in front of her and offered her a ride. At one point he told her he needed to go to a place to get gas and fill up his car. They drove up to a house in the middle of nowhere and he called the woman inside and offered her some tea. Unfortunately for her, she said yes. Almost immediately thereafter, he attacked her and after a brief struggle, tied her up. For the next few hours, the victim was subject to indescribable torture and violence. Her assailant also tore off one of her earrings and took it for himself. As you may have guessed, this man was Francis. By morning, the woman realized that she could get the rope off her hands then free her legs and run. She loosened the rope, waited for the right moment for Francis to move as far away as possible and rushed to the back door of the house. Before she left, she removed her pendant and tossed it under the bed. The woman feared that the police might not find any corroboration of her story so she decided to leave some personal item in his house and it really worked. The police searched Francis's house, found the very same pendant and arrested the man. At the trial he quickly realized that he could not get away with it and decided to confess to what he had done. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. The police in Western Australia who handled the Haley Dodd case were notified of Francis' arrest but they did not appear to be at all interested. No action was taken by the detectives to revive the eight-year-old case which was so closely a Francis crime. Only through the insistence of Haley's mother did the detectives agree to reopen the case, but they quickly concluded that there was still no evidence against Francis, which meant there was nothing they could do about it. All these years, Haley's family tried to get the police to investigate thoroughly, but they assured them that they had done everything in their power, desperate to wait for help from law enforcement. The relatives spent tens of thousands of dollars on private investigators, but all to no avail. The case did not take a new turn until six long years later in 2013, when an extremely outrageous fact came to light. It turned out that the police had simply forgotten about the evidence that ended up being the key to the case. The medical examiner, Tracy Horn, filed a request to reopen the investigation. The reason was that the very same car seat covers seized from Francis' neighbor's car in 1999 were found in evidence storage. Suddenly, it turned out that for 14 years they had never been tested for blood, DNA, and other evidence. When experts did retrieve them, they were immediately able to find a woman's earring that had snagged on the fabric of the covers. Taking a drawing of Lisa's just after her friend's disappearance, detectives were horrified to see. It was the same earring that Haley was wearing the morning of her disappearance. But that wasn't all. A human hair was found in one of the car mats that had also been removed from the car. Experts extracted a DNA sample from it that showed a match to Haley Dodd's mother's DNA. That meant that the hair was very likely Haley's own, but that probability was not 100%, which made it very difficult to prosecute Francis in the shortest possible time. As soon as the news leaked to the media, a wave of criticism poured in against the police. For 14 years, this evidence laid literally under the noses of the investigators. But in all that time, they never remembered it. Of course, such a find instantly changed the course of the case, and the detectives went to the other side of the country to interrogate Francis again. At the time, he was still in prison for assaulting a woman in 2007. The man gave them the same story he had told them 14 years earlier. He denied his involvement and assured them that he was shopping in Mura at the time of Haley's abduction. The interrogation, which lasted nearly four hours, was inconclusive, so the police had to prepare the case to go to trial. It wasn't until 2015 when he was formally charged with Haley's murder and deported to Western Australia. Two more years later, in late 2017, the trial began. Francis' defense insisted that all the evidence presented was circumstantial. The earring Haley bought at a local store was very cheap and popular, so it could have been left in the car by another woman. The hair found in the car showed an almost 100% match to Haley's DNA, but not an absolute exact match. Although a mistake here would have been highly unlikely, that was enough for the lawyers. But all these arguments seemed unconvincing to the judge. Perhaps Francis would still have had a chance to get away with it, if not for his crime in 2007. But then he didn't just kidnap a woman who was hitchhiking, he also took her earring. The prosecution believed that the man was collecting the victim's earrings as trophies, which only increased the suspicion against him in the end. As a result, the judge found him guilty of kidnapping and murdering Haley Dodd, sentencing him to 21 years in prison. All of this took place while his previous sentence was still pending. 
Francis was 62 years old at the time of his sentencing, but the story did not end there. The court believed Francis kidnapped and killed Haley, then hid her body, but it was never found, and the man himself refused to plead guilty. Haley's mother repeatedly asked the killer to tell her where he hid the body, but to no avail. And in 2018, she helped pass a new law that says murderers are not eligible for parole if they refuse to reveal the location of their victims' bodies. In 2020, another high-profile event occurred. The court granted Francis appeal to overturn his sentence and scheduled a new hearing. His lawyers again tried to insist that the man would not have had time to kidnap Haley between his trip to Mora and his return home, but the court felt that the time frame allowed him well enough to do so, especially given the rush with which he arrived home and immediately set off for Perth on his motorcycle. Moreover, the earring, along with the hair, were still on the list of key evidence against him, but Francis still managed to get a sentence changed. The court found him guilty of involuntary manslaughter, reducing his sentence from 21 years to 18 years. But thanks to a law passed in 2018, he would not be able to go free even after that time if he refused to identify the location of the body. There is another point in the whole story that keeps the detectives busy to this day. They are sure that many more women have become victims of Francis and that none of them managed to escape. This maniac could have been picking up young women on the roads for decades and what happened to them next only he knows. One of the most likely similar cases is the disappearance of a woman in late 2005. She hitchhiked to another city and was never seen again. The detective handling the case is certain that Francis kidnapped her because he knew the victim personally, but there is no evidence at this time. Perhaps the police will find it again in their warehouse a few years later, but it won't make a difference to the perpetrator. If the police had examined the car more thoroughly, Francis would have been arrested back in 1999. Now we can only guess how many lives he ruined in the ensuing years, but sooner or later, the mystery may be solved. There's another creepy thing about this whole story. Remember that in the initial stages of the investigation, the police identified three main suspects, including Francis. Now, one of them killed his wife five months after Haley disappeared, and the other, who worked as a school teacher, turned out to be one of the worst child molesters in Australian history. Too bad the police had no way to stop them at the time. If you liked this video, don't forget to support the channel with a like and share your opinion in the comments. This story is about a pair of lovesick maniacs from England who devoted their lives to killing children. Working as a team, the lovers would lure them into a deserted place and then subject them to hellish torments. Even after their arrest, the criminals found ways to torture the teenagers and prominent British politicians tried to secure their release. Meet Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Ian Brady was born on January 2, 1938, in Glasgow, Scotland. His mother, Margaret Stewart, worked as a waitress and who his father was is not known. According to his mother herself, he was a local journalist and died three months before her son was born. Realizing that she herself simply cannot cope with the upbringing of a child, Margaret gave three-month-old Ian to the Sloan family. They had four children of their own, but they accepted the boy. Ian took their last name but continued to see his mother regularly. At the age of nine, he and his family moved to the town of Pollock, where he enrolled in the local school. From an early age, his acquaintances noticed Ian's cruelty to animals. They later described the terrible things the child did. At school, his behavior only worsened. He twice broke into other people's homes, for which he ended up in the hands of the police. Alas, no serious punishment was incurred by this future maniac due to his age. In addition, Ian constantly bullied the younger children. At age 15, he left school and got a job at the shipyard. But after less than a year, the young man changed his occupation and became a messenger butcher. At the age of 16, he was again put on trial. His girlfriend, Elevon Grant, went to a dance with another boy for which Ian threatened her with a knife. The judge placed him on probation on one condition. The young man must live with his birth mother. So he did, moving to Manchester to live with his mother and her new husband, Patrick Brady. As you may have guessed, the would-be maniac took his stepfather's last name. He arranged for him to work as a porter of fruit at the market. But the hard work was not to Ian's liking. A year after the move, he was caught by the police on theft with a bag of lead seals. The young man intended to sell them on the black market and make extra money. But instead of money, he earned his first real sentence. Given that he was under 18 at the time of the crime, the judge sentenced Ian to two years in a juvenile facility. While serving his sentence, the young man managed to get alcohol in prison and got pretty drunk. 
For this, he was transferred to a stricter institution where he completed serving his sentence on November 14, 1953. Back in Manchester, Ian changed two jobs, but he was drawn to something more. Determined to improve his education, he began reading books. True, not all of these books were useful. One of his favorite works was Adolf Hitler's Main Kampf. In addition, he liked books about the crimes of the Nazis. Myra Hindley was born four years after Ian on July 23, 1942, in an area of Manchester. Her family was not an ideal family. Her alcoholic father regularly beat his daughter and instilled violence in her. The family lived in a dilapidated house with only one room that was more or less safe. After her parents had another daughter, Myra was sent to live with her grandmother. Her father taught the girl self-defense in a rather brutal way. He demanded that his daughter could fight back against any abuser and did not tolerate weakness. Once he made her beat up a neighbor's boy who scratched her cheek. Later, the maniac called this incident her first victory. Another shock in the girl's youth was the death of her close friend, 13-year-old Michael Higgins. One day he invited her to go for a swim in the local abandoned reservoir, but she refused. As a result, the boy drowned and Myra felt guilty. After that incident, the girl gradually began to delve into religion. She joined the parish of the local church and became godmother to Higgins' nephew. At 16, the girl took a job as a clerk in a small firm. Her duties were basic, brewing coffee, fetching something, printing out documents. Despite this, she won the love of the team from the very first days. After receiving her first paycheck, Myra spent it in a week, leaving her without a livelihood. Then her co-workers chipped in and gave her the same amount from their pockets. Around the same time, the girl planned to get engaged to her boyfriend, Ronnie Sinclair, but later changed her mind. At 17, she changed jobs, but she did not show the same enthusiasm for the new place. Six months later, she was fired for constant absenteeism. At the same time, Myra went to the judo section where even the guys didn't dare to fight with her. Once she got a taste for it, she could not stop in time and cause serious injury to her opponents. At the same time, Myra dyed her hair pink. The future maniacs met at Millward, where both got jobs. Myra was 19 years old at the time, Ian was 23. According to the young woman's diary, their first conversation took place on July 27, 1961. At first Myra felt sympathy for the young man despite his criminal record but later lost interest. However, six months after they met, Ian asked her out to a movie and the young woman agreed. The choice of a movie for a first date was as strange as possible a documentary about the Nuremberg Trials and they agreed on that. The couple continued to go to the movies for the most and soon Brady instilled in Myra an enduring interest in Nazis. Often they sat down together to read materials and books about the atrocities of the Third Reich while drinking German wine. Because of her new fascination, Myra began to imitate the Aryan young woman model. She dyed her hair white and started using dark red lipstick. Later, she dramatically changed her style of dressing to a more candid short skirts, leather jackets, and high-heeled shoes. The couple continued to work together, but every day they paid less and less attention to the team. To call the relationship perfect at the time was impossible. In a letter to her old friend, Myra once reported that Ian had slipped her sleeping pills. A few months later, she asked him not to pay any attention to that letter. Considering that the couple had little money in those years, they began to look for ways to get rich quickly. Eventually, Ian and Myra decided to rob a bank. The young woman rented a van and tried to learn how to shoot, but she failed to master the skill. Despite this, she eventually acquired a rifle and two revolvers. Eventually, the couple decided to abandon the idea. They were probably well aware that without the proper training and experience, they would not succeed. Instead, they really got into photography and bought professional equipment, but they only took pictures of each other and not in a very decent way. Two years after meeting in June, 1963, Ian came to Myra and her grandmother. A little later, they were given new housing under a government program since the old one was considered unsafe. It was also at this time that Brady first voiced to Myra his deepest dream of committing the perfect murder. He was inspired by the book Coercion by Meyer Levin, in which two teenagers planned to kill a 12-year-old boy and avoid the death penalty. The young woman was not deterred by this revelation and agreed to help her lover. The plan was very simple. Myra and Ian were going to look for the victim along the road, then take her to a remote place and kill her. Brady told Myra to drive the van down the street alone while he himself was to follow her on a motorcycle. Upon spotting a suitable victim, the maniac was about to signal his accomplice with his headlamp, after which she was to convince the victim to get into the car. 
On the evening of July 12th, just one month after moving in, they went out hunting. Brady chose the first victim and signaled Myra. She drove off past him. Catching up with her, he demanded an explanation. The young woman reported that the maniac's target was seven-year-old Marie Ruck, who lived next door to her mother. According to Myra, it would be extremely difficult for them to get away with it because the police would start searching for such a young child instantly. The couple then continued down the street, looking for another victim. At 8 p.m., on Froxmer Street, Brady again made his choice and Myra again recognized the girl. She turned out to be Pauline Reed, a 16-year-old friend of her younger sister who was on her way to the disco. Determined to act, Myra stopped and offered her a ride, whereupon the girl got into the car. To take her to a deserted place, Myra made up a story. She had supposedly lost a very expensive glove on the saddle with Heath. The area was popular with the locals for its rich supply of peat used as fertilizer. The unfortunate Pauline agreed to help her acquaintance. Shortly after arriving at the site, Brady drove up to them. Myra told the girl it was her boyfriend and he would help them in their search. How the situation unfolded further is unclear to the end. The problem is that Brady and Myra tell two different versions. But they all end up with the same story. Pauline is murdered. In Ian's version, he and his lover abused and killed the girl. Myra, on the other hand, claimed that she was left sitting in the car while Pauline and Brady went supposedly to look for the glove. After a while, the maniac returned alone and reported that the girl was dead. He took Myra to her body and she noticed that the girl's clothes were badly wrinkled. In my opinion, Myra's version makes no sense. What excuse would a 16-year-old girl have for going on a search with a guy she didn't know while Myra herself was sitting in the car? Most likely, with the story, the maniac was only trying to absolve herself of responsibility for direct participation in the murder. After burying the body, Myra and Brady loaded the motorcycle into the van and drove home. On the way, they spotted Pauline's mother and her brother looking for the girl. After a break of almost six months, the couple decided to act again, but this time they chose a 12-year-old boy. After spotting the victim in a store, they struck up a dialogue and offered the child a ride home. As an added incentive, Brady offered the boy a drink. Once in the car, he specified that the alcohol would have to be picked up at their house. A pair of maniacs asked the child to help find a fictional glove in Saddleworth. To his misfortune, the boy agreed. Next, the situation unfolded according to the same scenario. Hindley asserted that Brady had taken the child away from the car, abused, and killed him. The maniac once again stated that she was not present for all of this. Seven months later, on June 16, 1964, the couple similarly abducted 12-year-old Keith Bennett as he was on his way to his grandmother's house. He suffered the same fate of violence and murder. The police, who at the time were unaware of the existence of serial killers, first arrested the boy's stepfather but found no evidence against him. The next murder was also committed six months later on December 26, 1964. It is not quite clear whether they were able to sustain this cycle unintentionally or whether the pause was necessary to lull the police into a state of alertness. You would agree that if children started disappearing one after another in a relatively small town, law enforcement would throw all their energy into catching the maniac. But back to December 26th of that year, few days remained before the new year and Christmas. And Ian and Myra decided to give their town another unpleasant gift. This time, the scenario has changed dramatically. They looked for their new victim on the playground. She was 10-year-old Leslie and Downey. Scattering bags and purchases near the car, the maniacs asked the girl to help with the collection. After they also asked her to help them bring the bags home, the girl agreed and was attacked as soon as she crossed the threshold. The couple abused the unfortunate child for a long time, right in her home. Having played with her, the sadist killed her and took the corpse to Saddleworth. Again, Myra assured that she was not present at the murder. The attentive viewer remembers that the couple lived with Myra's grandmother. Where had she gone at the time of all these atrocities? The caring granddaughter sent her to relative's house and forbade her to return home. In spite of this, the old woman tried to return in the evening, but Myra simply would not let her in. The next day, after cleaning up the girl's corpse and the house, she still brought the grandmother back. The couple committed their next murder ten months later, breaking a peculiar cycle. But that's not the only thing that makes this case special. At the time, Maureen, Myra's younger sister, already had a husband, David Smith, 17. The couple often spent time together and the young man immediately won Brady's affection. First of all, he was ready to listen with interest to everything the maniac said, speculations about Nazis, philosophical speeches, dreams about robbing a bank, and so on. 
Secondly, he had already been in the police station more than once. Just as Ian had been in his years, even their crimes were very similar. Smith had been caught breaking into someone else's house and inflicting severe battery. Perhaps Brady saw him as his protege, a new member of the improvised gang. As time passed, the young man made more and more visits to their house where in long conversations with Ian, talk of murder began to spill over. It got to the point where Myra began to seriously worry if their relative would run to the police. But Brady was adamant. He thought Smith was his own and trusted him. Shortly before the next crime, he even told her that he and Smith would soon commit a crime together. It all happened on the evening of October 6, 1965. Myra and Brady went to Manchester Central Station to look for a new victim. And soon Ian made his choice. He met 17-year-old Edward Evans who agreed to go to his house after a little chat. Upon arriving at the house, the company drank wine, and at a certain point, Brady sent Myra to get Smith. After he arrived, the action began to unfold rapidly. From Myra's words, it was possible to reconstruct the following picture. She had gone into the kitchen to feed the dogs. Smith remained in the living room. A few minutes later, she heard screams and sounds of fighting. Upon entering the room, the girl saw Evans and Brady struggling. After a brief fight, Ian grabbed an axe and struck the victim several times with the blade. He then wrapped an electrical wire around the neck of the unconscious Evans and strangled him. After what he had done, Brady wanted to take the body immediately to the wasteland, but it was too heavy. In addition, the maniac twisted his leg during the fight. In the end, he decided to leave it at the house and go with Smith to Saddleworth the next day. He asked him to stay so he could feel the gravity of what he had done. At first, Smith agreed to help Brady get rid of the body. Perhaps he was too frightened to refuse. With a little history of minor law breaking under his belt, the young man might not have shared the sadistic tendencies of the homicidal couple. When he returned home, he decided to tell his wife what had happened at her sister's house. After listening, she asked him to report the horror to the police. Smith listened to her and called the police from a nearby phone booth at 6 in the morning. His story was slightly different from what Myra could later say. The police archives contained an exact transcript of that call. Brady opened the door and said in a loud voice, You want the little buns? I nodded to say yes, and he led me into the kitchen and gave me three small buns with a drink and said, You want the rest too? When I entered the house, the door to the living room was closed. Ian went into the living room and I stayed waiting in the kitchen. I waited a minute or two and then suddenly I heard a wild scream. Like a woman screaming, a very high-pitched voice. Then the screaming continued, one after another, very loudly. Then I heard Myra screaming very loudly to him, Dave, help him. When I ran in, I just stood in the living room and saw the young guy. He was lying head and shoulders on the couch and his feet were on the floor. He was face up. Ian was standing over him, facing him. The guy was still screaming. Ian had an axe in his hand. He held it over his head and hit the guy on the left side of his head with the axe. I heard the blow. It was a terribly hard blow. It was a horrible sound. Although Smith told it all in his usual monotone voice, the abundance of detail made the police take the call as seriously as possible. They decided to proceed carefully to get into the house without a court order. A policeman drove up to the scene and picked up a local baker who delivers bread in the morning. Wearing his apron, he took a couple of loaves from him and knocked on the maniac's door. An unsuspecting Myra opened it. Next, the policeman took out his identification card and quickly made his way into the house where he caught Brady. He was writing an explanatory letter to work, asking for time off because of an injury. The officer told a made-up story about investigating gun cases and asked to see the house. It was unclear why, but Myra agreed. He inspected all but one room, the one where the young man's body lay. Because it was locked, the policeman asked to open it, but Myra said she had left the keys at work. Of course, there was no credibility to the story. The officer offered to drive the young woman to her place of work and retrieve the key but she gave up and opened the door. After finding the body, Brady was immediately arrested. Before leaving the house, he told a police officer that there had been an argument between him and Evans trying to make it look like self-defense. When questioned, he continued with his version, but it sounded very unconvincing. Brady allegedly met Evans in a bar, a fight ensued, and somehow the boy came to his house where the fight ensued. Smith had also testified against Brady at the time, and the police believed his testimony much more. Ian later insisted that Smith had been directly involved in the murder. The young man described how Ian bragged about killing three or four children and even gave the approximate locations of their burial. He also revealed the presence of two evident suitcases in which the killers kept various trophies. 
The problem was that these suitcases were stored in some unknown lost and found office in Manchester. It took the police several days to find them. The arrest of the maniacs was followed by a search of their home. There, the police found many interesting finds, notebooks, lists of names, photographs of Brady and Myris, Saddleworth, and explicit pictures of them. The notebooks contain lists of coded words which the police were quickly able to decipher. It turned out that Brady kept records of burial sites, weapons, and methods of killing. Alas, it was impossible to ascertain the exact location of all the victims on the basis of this information as it was rather superficial. Another book contained a list of names, including all the victims of the couple. But here's the strange thing. In addition to the victims we know, the list contained the names of other children. With all this information, the investigators questioned Brady again, and his story was once again very weak. Allegedly, the list contained the names of his friends, and he had joked about killing children in his conversation with Smith. At the same time, the police managed to find the very suitcases, the contents of which shocked everyone. There were photographs of a naked girl. Also found in them were audio tapes, one of which would soon become perhaps the most damning evidence in history. They contained cries and pleas for help. Other tapes contained recordings of Nazi plays. After listening to the tape, one of the mothers recognized the voice of her daughter, Leslie and Downey. It is frightening to imagine how difficult all this was for the poor woman. In addition, the suitcases contained many photographs of the backdrop of the marshland, various batons and lashes, and erotic magazines. All of this, including a recording of the girl screaming and a photograph of her, would have been enough to press charges. But the police had yet to read Saddleworth. They faced the daunting task of identifying the victim's burial sites from the many photos. They were also assisted in this by a 12-year-old neighbor, Myra, who had once gone with them to the swamp to pick Pete. It is not known why, but the maniacs left the girl alive. Perhaps Myra and Brady's guilt in such a case would have been obvious. 150 officers were involved in the search for bodies in the swamps. Initially, they focused on the area near Route A628, but later based on witness statements, they moved to Route A635. That's where their first find awaited them. On October 10th, police noticed a hand sticking out of the ground. Because of the degree of decomposition of the body, the identity of the child could not be confirmed until after the examination. She turned out to be Leslie and Downey. Eleven days later, police discovered the body of John Kilbride. At the same time, Brady and Myra were charged with Leslie's murder, extending their custody. Despite this baggage of evidence, Ian continued to try to feed the police flimsy tales in an effort to avoid punishment. When asked about the origin of the nude photographs of the little girl taken at the Hindley house, he did not deny that he had taken them. However, he insisted that the girl had been brought to their home by two men and then taken away to an unknown destination. Because of the onset of winter, the police temporarily halted their search of the swamps, but a virtually win-win case had already formed against Myra and Brady. On April 19, 1966, one of the most high-profile trials in British history began. Both lovers were charged with the murder of Edward Evans, Leslie Downey, and John Kilbride. The turning point was the very recording of little Leslie's last words. The case hurt her from the first to the last second. The reporters in attendance called the tape the most damning evidence ever put on the judge's desk. The trial lasted more than two weeks, and on May 6th, the court found the maniacs guilty, sentencing them to life in different prisons. That was the last day they saw each other. The couple kept up an active correspondence, but over the years, their fervor waned, and their letters came less and less frequently. The trial was remembered for another interesting moment. David Smith, who became the main witness, signed a contract with a local newspaper under which he undertook to give an exclusive interview in case Myra and Brady were convicted. The paper paid him £1,000 for this, which was quite a substantial sum at the time. Smith and his wife spent the money on a holiday in a five-star French hotel, which angered the judge. He found such a transaction inappropriate, but there was nothing he could do about it within the law. Since then, the story of Myra and Brady split into two lines, but it was not over. In 1974, Ian managed to change several prisons until he finally stayed at Wormwood Scrubs. Here began the most interesting part. The maniac managed to abuse children while in prison. How is that possible? Shortly after his transfer to Wormwood Scrubs, Brady, who had been placed in solitary confinement, went on a hunger strike. He was unhappy with the ban on socializing with other inmates. Prison officials have decided that the child killer is going to afterlife rather quickly. 
As a result of his dramatic weight loss, the maniac was transferred to the hospital wing where his life took on new colors. He was allowed to watch television and do house cleaning work. At the same time, juvenile delinquents with mental disabilities were admitted to the hospital wing of the prison. In 1981, one of these teenagers said that Brady had forced him into intimate contact. Later, similar statements by the victims surfaced repeatedly. Taking advantage of access to secluded corners of the prison as a janitor, Ian led his victims there. When prison officials learned of this, he was banned from cleaning, but no further charges were filed. More interestingly, he was left in the hospital wing next to the same teenagers. It would seem how such a thing is possible. But there was nothing the chief medical officer of the prison could do about it. British law mandates that prisoners be assisted and Brady used this skillfully. He threatened to resume his hunger strike every time he talked about being transferred back to a cell. In 1982, a harsh decision was made to transfer the maniac to another prison with stricter conditions. However, three years later, in 1985, Brady was declared insane. Thanks to this, another transfer awaited him to Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital. Many of you may have wondered how such a violent sadist managed not only to establish a comfortable life in prison, but also to do his dirty work with teenagers. The answer might surprise you. He was helped by the Earl of Longford, Frank Pakenham, one of the leading politicians of the time, to get favors and privileges. Brady approached him while in prison and soon the Earl actually sided with him. Of course, there was no talk of helping to get the charges dropped, but Ian didn't count on that. Pakenham helped him stay in hospital by appealing to Britain's home security himself. After that, the politician repeatedly bailed out his newly minted friend by pulling the right strings in the British upper echelons. But the main request of Brady he could not fulfill. The maniac dreamed of a date with Myra. On that note, let's move back a bit to Hindley's story. Her life behind bars was much less intense, but not without interesting moments. While in prison, she managed to have a mistress, but more interestingly, she was able to get out of there for a while. Not long after beginning her sentence, Hinley began a tort affair with the warden, Patricia Cairns. Together, they planned an escape, but were caught by the police in the preparation stage. As a result, Cairns went from a prison employee to a prisoner for six years. In November 1986, Keith Bennett's mother wrote her a letter begging her to tell her about her son's fate. Pain and despair, and the last lines make clear. I am a simple woman working in the kitchens of Christie's Hospital. It took me five weeks to write this letter because it is very important to me that it be accepted by you as it is a plea for help. Please, Miss Hindley, help me. It is impossible to say for certain whether Hindley was moved by this or whether there were other motives, but she agreed to take part in the investigative experiment. Under tight security, she was taken to Saddleworth Heath, which was cordoned off by 200 police officers along its perimeter. Myra's task was to locate the bodies of children whose fate was still unknown. She failed in that task. The search yielded no results. The detectives who organized her participation were harshly criticized for wasting money on an event of this scale. However, it bore fruit a little later. One of the detectives continued to visit the woman in prison and soon she decided to partially confess to a number of crimes. Myra recounted all the murders but insisted she was never there at those moments. Of course, no one was in a hurry to believe it. But the detective was happy with the new information in any volume. Since then, Myra had been out on the heath several more times. And in 1987, the cops were successful. And that's what you call the discovery of Leslie and Downey's body. And later Pauline reads, once Brady learned of his former lover's cooperation with the investigation, he also decided to partially confess to what he had done. True, the maniac asked to be given the means and opportunity to leave his life, which no one could legally do. Having been refused, Ian still talked and also expressed his desire to help the police in their search for the remaining bodies. On July 3rd of that year, he was taken to Saddleworth, where he was never able to pinpoint Keith Bennett's burial site. Later, frustrated detectives refused to make another trip to the Heath with the maniac and he turned to reporters. In a letter, he indirectly admitted they had killed five other children, but police could not confirm this information. Six months later, Brady still secured a second visit to Saddleworth, but again proved useless. Keith's body has not been found to this day. In 2003, the police resumed their search using the most advanced technology. It gave no results. They only had 40-year-old photos, which made finding the right place next to impossible. Myra made a long attempt to obtain an early release. She wrote appeals, secured Lord Longford's support, and by the early noughties, almost everyone was convinced that her release was inevitable. Unfortunately for her, life decided otherwise. 
Hindley died on November 15, 2002 at the age of 60. The cause was complications from a heart condition. The rest of Brady's life was less rosy. While Myra's release was seriously considered, Ian's release from the asylum was being given the go-ahead by senior British officials. With each year in the asylum, he gradually went mad until he lost what little, if any sanity he had left. In spite of this, he managed to live long enough until he was 79 years old. In 2017, the maniac died of cancer and the urn with his ashes was buried at the bottom of the sea. Brady's death made few people sad. His namesake, Police Federation Branch Chairman Ian Hansen noted that such monsters deserve no sympathy. That was the end of the story of the child murdering lovers. But in Britain, their names will long be remembered. Ian and Myra are a prime example of inhumanity.